morning and welcome to the worship service of the New Elam Baptist Church. My name is Les Venable and I'm the pastor here and I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and thank you for coming to, to worship with us today. A few announcements as we begin worship. Uh, there will be a women's Bible study, a small group meeting following this uh, service today. I think that's at 11 o'clock and so Again, it's an open meeting. Uh, those who wish to attend merely come back to the same link and you'll be admitted into that meeting. Um, we had a church business meeting on Saturday and uh, it went well. Uh, we find ourselves um, positioned uh, to have met our obligations for the year. And so we're thankful that you have continued to, uh, to give even in the fact of not being able to assemble as we would desire. But we thank you for your uh, continued cooperation. We thank you for the volunteers who come to maintain the facility and to keep everything prepared for our return. It's a very special day in the life of our church when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, and, and typically, I would be wearing white. It's kind of a part of our tradition. Uh, but I'm wearing black today because I'm, I'm grieving somewhat. Uh, I'm grieving for our nation. I'm grieving for a, a lack of cooperation and a spirit that has caused us to be considered one of the greatest nations in the world and, and, and a people who love the Lord. We celebrate the uh, division, the sacrifice, the, the life of Martin Luther King. Uh, this week, this weekend, uh, we think about uh, the opportunity that has come into place is making his anniversary day a day of service but i would encourage you to make it also a day of forgiveness i would encourage you to make it also a day of reconciliation that we might reach out to others with whom we are not necessarily engaged on a regular basis and try to make it an effort to be friendly to find ourselves being peacemakers in the midst of people who don't want peace and so i'm grieving but i'm lifted up because i'm with you and that changes my perspective. When we come together, even as we come together virtually, uh, I feel better, I pray you feel better, I pray we all come away feeling better, simply because we've been together and as the choir would remind us, we're in the right place at the right time to receive a blessing from the Lord. So as we open our worship today, I would invite uh, Donna Venable to give us both the scripture and our invocation prayer. And thank you for participating today. Good morning. New Enum family and friends, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in your heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and rest in my loving presence. You know that this day will bring difficulties and you are trying to think your way through them as their trials occur. Mm. As you anticipate what is ahead of you, you forget that I am with you now and always. Rehearsing your troubles results in experiencing them more than one time, whereas you are meant to go to them only once when they actually occur. Mm. Do not multiply your sufferings in this way. Instead, come to me and relax in my peace. I am strengthening you and preparing you for this day transforming your fear into confident trust. Amen. Thank you for last night's rest and this morning's waking. Thank you, Lord, for your care and comfort as we come to this place this morning. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to give us peace and to abide within our messenger as we hear his word today. Thank you for being in this place. Thank you for your care and comfort. We love you, Lord, and invite you to stay with us throughout this service today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you for that word and for the prayer as well. We'll continue our worship with the first song from our, our, our from our choir out of the library of music that we have. And again, we were uh, we always operate an invitation to those who would care to participate in in, in music uh, that we don't have to stop singing and getting together and making music just because there are restrictions on our gathering. So consider that. But in the, in the meantime, we'll continue. The first song was You're in the Right Place. And then this song continues that same theme. Thank God for the choir for reminding us how wonderful it is to be together and how all are welcome in this place. And it's also significant that uh, we have found ourselves increasingly outside this place, ministering to the community and, and expressing to people the love of Jesus Christ as representatives here on earth. New Zealand Baptist Church has a lot to be proud of and we're thankful for you all. This is a day, uh, again, where we commune. So I would ask you to prepare your communion elements uh, at home so that we might share after the sermon today. Additionally, I would uh, give you a heads up. The, uh, the text for the scripture today is in the book of Joshua. 
Joshua Old Testament book, the 24th chapter message will be coming from. So if you find a few minutes ahead of time to prepare yourselves for the communion and also for the text, it might be helpful as we, as we continue. As we prayed on Wednesday uh, that just passed for those in public service, um, particularly those in our fellowship who uh, have to deal with downtown, you might say, you know, uh, Zach Jacobs is in the Capitol Police. And so they are on alert and getting ready for hopefully what will not happen. But certainly the inauguration that's coming of our president will cause some people to have some response to that. So we continue to pray for him and our sister, Betty Burrell, who, who works for the city and in proximity to the Capitol and our sister Cecilia Garner as well, who all serve uh, well in the administration of our local and state government. And there are others who are in public service who are exposed to um, the potential for disease or acquiring the, the COVID um, pandemic effects, we want to lift those as well, those who work in, in public sector jobs, uh, helping us to continue as, as a community to provide the resources we need. And then there are those in our, in our fellowship who are still protecting us in their military service, uh, Sister Briscoe, uh, Brother Woodson, Sister Briscoe's family, several others. And so it's a distinct honor today to have Deacon Johnson, our Deacon Johnson, who is a medal award recipient from his service in the United States government in the service to our nation. Ask Deacon Johnson to give some consideration to the prayer concerns. He's been with us on Wednesday, he was with us Saturday as we lifted these names. And so he understands the concerns um, of those who are sick, the, the, the family of our, our Deacon, um, the chair of our Deacon board, uh, others, in the document who have family members who are not well. And again, a thanks to God for, for all of you who continue to support the ministry here at New England Baptist Church through your generous giving. Pray that you will continue because God will bless you. God has blessed you. God will continue to bless you as you give. So I ask now Deacon Johnson if you will come and, and lead us to the throne of, of grace with consideration for all that we have going on. Deacon Johnson. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, New Elam. <clears throat> Let us pray. Most holy and all wise God, to give all good and perfect gifts to God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, who sit high and look low and see all, hear all, know all. Lord, we come this beautiful Sunday morning right now, Father God, to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to call your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, goodness, and your grace. Allow us to be here one more time in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, we pray, God, that you just give us for all our sin and our shortcomings one more time in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Down the cross for our sin for the sins of the world, Father God. Buried in the bar, tomb, but rolled on the third day for all power in his hand. And now sits on the right hand you, the Father. Still make sense for our sin for the sins of the world. Lord, we, we thank you. We glorify your name right now, Father God. Lord, we come this morning right now, Father God, praying, Lord, because our nation, this country, Lord, is, is going through things right now, Father God. We live in evil days and perilous times right now, Father God. But you say in your word, Father God, that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Lord, that's the remedy right now, Father. We need to pray and ask you right now, Father God. Stay in prayer right now, Lord, for you, for you to lead us and direct our path right now, Lord. Lord, I pray for our, Lord God, all those that, was, those that was sick on our church list right now, Father God, to those who are going through trial and tribulation and health problems right now, Lord. You just touch them, Lord, and touch their bodies in the name of Jesus right now, Father God. You know who they are right now, Father God, and I... Can I mention all the names right now, Father God, but our church members, Lord, who are sick and shut in right now, you touch them and heal their bodies in the name of Jesus, Lord, and those that uh, in our community right now, Father God, that you touch them also, Father God. 
In Jesus' name, we ask and pray, Lord, because you can do all things but fail right now, Father God. And pray, God, for our Lord, for our, all those who serve in our country right now, Lord, in the military right now, Father God, what they're going through, Lord, that you just build a hedge around them. She them from all harm, hurting things right now, Father God. And they ever feel they do this right now, Father God, for the country. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray right now, Lord. Pray, God, that all those, Lord, who are up there in D.C. area right now, Father God, who got to protect the capital right now, Lord, that you be with them right now, Father God, and direct their path right now, Father God. Give them wisdom, direction, and guidance, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray, Lord. And pray, God, you just bless the Lord, the orphan that will be taken up right now, Father God. So our trust ministry continue to go on right now, Father God. Even though we're not inside right now, Father, we're on Zoom right now, Lord, but you bless us, Lord, with your financials, that we get financial, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray right now, Father God. We just glorify your name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being here, for being in the land of living. One more time right now, Lord, and we glorify your name right now, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray, Lord. Bless all those right now, Father God. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, and pray for this country and those around the world right now, Lord. For... It's time for prayer right now, Father God. It's time for prayer right now, Lord. We glorify your name. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Deacon Johnson, for, for your service and for your dedication to our country and dedication to the church in this community. We, we give thanks to God for you and, and for all those who, as he reminds us, would continue to pray because this is a time for us to pray. This is a time for us to pray for others because God has called us to be purposeful about praying for other people, to be people of reconciliation in the face of those who would want to be divisive. So I encourage you to do as he, as he has said, to, to pray. It's time to pray for ourselves, for our own protection, for the protection of those who protect us and, and for those even who would want to despitefully come against us, pray. And he also reminded us that our God is great. That God is able to do above and beyond what we might even be able to expect. And so the next song helps us to reinforce that same concept. The choir will sing our second song before our message for the day, which comes again from the book of Joshua, chapter 24. <laughs>
man. Thank you, choir. The, uh, the song helped me to remember as I looked at it that uh, the choir members have certainly been faithful and one of the more faithful, all of them are faithful. Brother Johnny Crump just had a birthday and I'm not sure we uh, celebrated our birthdays. I know uh, I was made aware that Russell Abrams has one coming up. Uh, Deacon Jefferson has one coming up. Uh, several, several that we need to remember and celebrate with folks even in these times. So um, we're grateful that as a result of the, uh, the church meeting, there's been uh, an announcement that we're gonna reinstitute the newsletter. And so if you have some interesting uh, tidbits that you wanna share with the rest of the congregation, please forward those to us. And uh, we'll make sure we get those in a newsletter that we're gonna be able to, uh, to, to publish on a more consistent basis to help us to stay together. So this uh, today, the uh, text for the song is uh, from Joshua, Old Testament, Joshua. You will recall Joshua was given the commission to lead the children into the promised land. The 24th chapter of the book of Joshua is, is the text for today. I'm reading from the King James Version. Joshua 24, I'm going to read the first 15 verses. And it reads this way, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. You might know that Joshua is preparing for his death, and so he's called the leadership into into a meeting. And Joshua said unto all the people, thus said the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and, and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it, but, but Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and, and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt. According to that which I did among them and afterward, I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And ye came unto the sea, and, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And he dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the, and the men of Jericho fought against you the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Gerashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you and even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build. And ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive, olive yards, which ye planted not, do you eat? Now, therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading 
in the hearing. And now, Lord, I pray that you would empower the proclamation of your word. Inspire me, Holy Spirit, to, to properly proclaim the message you have given to your people for this time. I pray, Lord, for strength and clarity that your word might go forth in power and that your people might be blessed as a result of having heard what it is you have given unto me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Joshua 24, 1 through 15, I have titled this message, Making the Right Choice. Making the Right Choice. This message focuses on a truth. A truth that the choice is ours as it relates to how we think, how it relates to what we are enthused about. And how we think about our situations will determine our response to these situations. Henry Ford, you may remember, Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. I personally, be personally believe he came to this conclusion after reading the first part of verse 7 from Proverbs chapter 23, where it says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In this message, I want us to understand that the choice is ours as it relates to how we think about our situations, and that determines our response to situations. This week, this weekend, we celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King. We celebrate the start of a new administration, the executive administration in this great nation that we all call home. We all call ours. This is a time for change and change requires us as it always does to make decisions, significant decisions. Martin Luther King Jr. made several significant decisions during his far too brief life and career. I want you to remember April 12th, 1963. On that date, Martin Luther King Jr. and nearly 50 other protesters and civil rights leaders were arrested after leading a Good Friday demonstration as part of the Birmingham campaign, it was called. The Birmingham campaign was designed to bring national attention to the, the brutal racist treatment that was suffered by blacks in one of the most segregated cities in America, Birmingham. Birmingham later called Bombingham, Alabama. For months, an organized boycott of the city's white-owned business had failed to achieve any meaningful results, leaving King and others convinced that they had no other options other than direct action. And so they ignored a recently passed ordinance that, that prohibited public gathering without an official permit. For King, he was arrested. This arrest, his 13th, would become one of the most important of his career. He was thrown into solitary confinement, and he was initially denied access to his lawyers or even allowed to contact his wife. It was only at the urging of President John F. Kennedy that, that he was allowed to contact both his lawyers and his wife. As previously agreed upon, King did not immediately, was not immediately bailed out by his supporters. He chose to stay longer in jail because the strategy was to draw additional attention to the plight of black Americans, what they were struggling with, not just in Bombingham, but across America. Shortly after King's arrest, a friend, a friend smuggled in a copy of an April 12 Birmingham newspaper, which included an open letter. It was written by eight local Christian and Jewish religious leaders, which criticized both the demonstrations and King himself, whom they considered an outside agitator. Funny even today how the establishment regards protest. When professional athletes kneel at the flag before playing a game, they're highly criticized. We even found the president encouraging owners to fire those sons. Well, it was a word. And yet when insurrectionists stormed the Capitol and beat peacekeepers with the same flag that those athletes were kneeling before in peace, the response was different. Isolated in his cell, King began working on a response. 
without notes, without research materials, King drafted an impassioned defense of the use of nonviolence, but direct action. Over the course of the letter's 7,000 words, which is now famously called Letter from a Birmingham Jail, it's must read material. Letters, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. We should all read that. He turned his criticism back upon both the, the nation's religious leaders and the more moderate minded white Americans, rebuking them for sitting passively on the sidelines while King and the others risked everything, agitating for change. King drew inspiration for his words from a long line of religious and political philosophers, quoting everyone from St. Augustine and Socrates to Thomas Jefferson, and even then the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren. Earl Warren had overseen the Supreme Court's landmark civil rights ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education. For those, including the Birmingham religious leaders who, who urged caution and remained convinced that the time would solve the nation's racial issues, King reminded them of Warren's own words on the need for desegregation. Those words were justice too long delayed is justice denied. And for those who thought the Atlanta-based King had no right to interfere with issues in Alabama, King argued in one of his most famous phrases that he could not sit idly in Atlanta because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Without writing papers, King initially began jotting down notes in the margin of the newspaper itself before writing out portions of the work on scraps of paper that he gave to his attorneys. The attorneys passed it along to one of King's allies, the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, who had left the pastorate of the Guilfield Baptist Church in Petersburg to become a lieutenant for King. So Wyatt Walker started compiling the letter, which eventually ran to 21 double-spaced type pages. And it's somewhat curious that the King never sent a copy to any of the eight Birmingham clergy to whom he was responding in this letter. So many believe that the intent of the letter was really to have a much broader national audience all along. Dr. King was finally released from jail on April 20th, four days after writing the letter. Despite the harsh treatment he and his fellow protesters had received, King continued his work at Birmingham. Just two weeks later, more than 1,000 school children took part in the famed Children's Crusade, skipping school to march through the city streets, advocating for integration and racial equality. Birmingham's Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, whom King had repeatedly criticized in his letter for his harsh treatment, ordered fire hoses and police dogs to be turned on these young people. More than 600 of those young folks were jailed on the first day alone. The brutal, cruel police tactics on display in Alabama were broadcast on televisions around the world, and America was horrified. With Birmingham in chaos and business shuttered, local officials were forced to meet with King and agreed to some, but not all, of his demands. On June 12th, with the horrific events in Birmingham still burning on the American consciousness and, and following Governor George Wallace's refusal to integrate the University of Alabama without the assistance of the United States National Guard, President Kennedy addressed the nation. He announced his plans to present sweeping civil rights legislation to the United States Congress. Kennedy's announcement, however, did little to, to stop the unrest in Birmingham and on September 15th, 1963, a Ku Klux Klan bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church left four young African-American girls dead. By this time, King's letter from Birmingham jail had begun to appear in publications across, across the country. Months early, Harvey Shapiro, an editor at the New York Times, had, had urged King to use his frequent jailing as an opportunity to write a longer defense of the use of nonviolent tactics, and, and thought King did so. The New York Times chose not to publish it. Some of it did. The Atlantic Monthly and the Christian Century were two, one of the most prominent Protestant magazines in the nation at that time. 
In the weeks leading up to the March on Washington, King Southern Christian Leadership Conference used the letter as a part of its fundraising efforts, and King himself used it as the basis for a book, also required reading. The book is titled Why We Can't Wait, which looked back upon the success and failures of the Birmingham campaign. The book was released in July 1964, the same month President Lyndon Johnson signed the landmark Civil Rights Act into law. Significant choices, courage draining choices were and remain a major part of the American history. We are called to make choices. We must continue to pray for and support those who have the responsibility to see the opportunities to make choices for good. And we are called by God to make choices for good in our own lives. There was an Australian Holocaust survivor named Dr. Viktor Frankl. He was a neurologist, a psychiatrist. He wrote a book titled Man's Search for Meaning, very famous book also. This book was based on his experiences in various Nazi concentration camps during World War II. Dr. Frankel described his psychotherapeutic method, which involved identifying a purpose in life to feel positive about, and then immersing yourself, imagining that outcome. What he said was the way a prisoner imagined the future affected how you were going to live, your longevity. He also identified three psychological reactions that all of the inmates he thought experienced to one degree or another. He said, first, there was shock, shock during initial admission phase in the camp. And after the shock, then apathy would set in. They would become accustomed to the, the camp's existence. And, and, and the inmates' values only uh, turned to themselves only. It was as if their only real concern was helping themselves, helping themselves and their friends to survive. And then thirdly, the, it, that turned into a, a depersonalization, a moral deformity. The morals began to loosen. Bitterness, disillusionment set in, and, it, and Dr. Frankel starts that lingering thought would hang over them even if they survived, even if they were liberated. So his conclusion was that the meaning of life is found in every moment of living that life itself never ceases to have meaning, even in suffering and death. He also concluded from his experience that a, that a, a prisoner's psychological reactions are not solely the result of the conditions in, a, in life, but from the freedom of choice that we always have, even in suffering. The inner hold that a prisoner has on, on their spiritual self relies on having a hope in the future. And that once a prisoner loses that hope, they're doomed. One of his most famous sayings was, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you have done to me. This is one of, uh, this is the last one freedom that we have, our attitude that we give toward any of life's circumstances. I'm not sure about Dr. Frankel's conclusions I'm not sure as its accuracy relates to, to all Holocaust victims or survivors, and I'm not really advocating his teachings. I'm not sure it even relates to those who are enduring hardships even now. But I want to introduce this message to you this morning with what he said and with what Dr. King did, because I do believe it is applicable to what we will witness in 2021. See, as we continue along in this new year, we have an opportunity to reflect on 2020. There were a lot of things that went wrong in 2020, but we've got to remember there were also some things that went right. In our own personal life, we made some good choices and maybe we made some poor choices. And for what it's worth, we can now look back at our choices and, and hope that 2021 is going to be better. As we reflect on 2020, we cannot look back and not think about how our lives changed due to COVID-19 or the long-term impact of that pandemic. It's a fact that people lost their lives in 2020. 
As a matter of record, more people died in the United States in 2020 than in any other single year in our history. And it was due partly to the pandemic. All of those deaths affected untold families and friends. And so we're now entering 2021 wondering what is normal going to look like? What is normal going to look like for those who lost others who were important in their lives? As I thought about this first communion message for 2021, I thought about what, what Dr. King did and what people like Dr. Frankel said. He said that all of the prisoners experienced something while in the camps. First, they experienced shock during the initial admission. And I want you to think back to last March when our country went into lockdown. People were shocked. People were angry. People were afraid. This was the first time in our lifetime that we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was next. You couldn't find personal protective equipment, such as face masks. All the stores were sold out. The national stockpile was insufficient for the country's needs. There was shock. There was dismay. You couldn't even find toilet paper. And then as we got through the first few months, people began to, to demonstrate apathy. They started demonstrating apathy become, becoming existing in this pandemic. People began to focus on what was in their best interest in order for them to survive. Some exhibited continued fear and loneliness after being afraid and alone for such long extended periods of time. And the fear turned into anger and frustration. Jobs were lost. Some believe their personal freedoms were under attack. And I strongly believe that this shock contributed to frightened people responding to the suggestions of a desperate, a desperate, desperate to keep and, and build power. The one who used their fears for personal gain and chose to hold the memories of those who supported him in his failed efforts. Don't forget payday is coming. So now we are approaching the third phase of what Dr. Frankel described as reactions of depersonalization, moral deformity, bitterness, disillusionment for the person who survives and is liberated. He described the camps changed a prisoner's mental health as seen by the bitterness and disillusionment that they faced when they were liberated. He described the feelings people had when they returned home and, and there was no one there to greet them. The hope of returning home to their families, which, which sustained them while they were in the camp, was now lost because everyone was gone. And I want you to see this because while the pandemic might not have taken your loved one, there are many, many households where this is not true. For some, there will be no coming home. And the bitterness and sadness of those waiting for many is overwhelming. It may be continuing to the frustration we see in the streets. As we enter 2021 and the possibility that the pandemic will be over, pray to God, we must deal with the scars that it has caused. It's hurt us deeply. We must continue to deal with the mental attacks that cause prolonged fear, that is causing anger, that is causing frustration, that is causing people to turn against one another. And for many, once we come out on the other side, we've got to start to redefine what will be normal for us. What will life be like without masks? Will there be a time when we will have life without masks? When will normalcy return and we'll be able to come back to church? When will things be normal and we'll be able to go to the movies? When will normalcy allow us to sit freely eating at restaurants or have large family gatherings? All of these will be great, but for some, there will be loved ones who will be missing. This cannot be overlooked in our churches and in our relationships. All of us have suffered, but not of all of us have suffered the same. That understanding brings me to the quote from Dr. Frankel. He said, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last one's freedom is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. And I want you to think about his saying in another way. He was talking about the Nazi soldiers and how they demeaned the prisoners. I want you to think about this as a world 
circles us in the world around us, how we choose to respond to the world in 2021 is going to be totally up to us. We can carry our baggage from 2020 into 21, or we can choose a different way. Dr. King said it another way. He said, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. We can choose how we respond. We can choose how we think about others. When Joshua was giving his farewell address as he was preparing to die, he, he remembered everything that the children of Israel had done since they left Egypt. He knew of their potential to turn from the Lord after their own wicked ways. As he prepared to make his last transition, he said to the people, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you're going to serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you're living. But as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua asked the people to make a choice about who they would serve. He said, make a choice because it is up to you. What is interesting here is Joshua is on his deathbed. But even on his deathbed, he proclaimed that he and his house would continue to serve the Lord. How, you might ask, could he make such a statement even on his deathbed? Well, Joshua had faith that his family would not turn from following God even when he died. He was so certain that he made this proclamation even as he lay on his deathbed. And so as we enter 2021, I'm asking you, who are you going to serve this year? In 2020, we witnessed the faith of some people being shattered because of what was happening around them. We witnessed, we witnessed churches closing. We witnessed churches closing and their doors will not ever reopen because of what is happening around them. And we might just witness the non-return of members coming back to live worship, frankly, because people have found it very convenient to stay at home, found it convenient to hear the word from the comfort of their homes, found it convenient to hear the word that they want to hear from the voice they want to hear. But who will you serve as you consider that question? How will you respond in 2021 is the question. I have a dear friend. I have a dear friend who's very sophisticated, very smart, very successful. But she occasionally reminds me that there are times when her rearing in the hood wants to cause her to just tell somebody like it is, especially when somebody is getting on her nerves. And you know, sometimes we all feel the urge to not hold back on speaking what the person would normally, we would want to hold inside. I think all of us got a little bit of hood in us, but the fact that we don't let the hood loose speaks to our ability to make a choice. See, we can respond to a situation thoughtfully, or we can react immediately to the situation and the person causing the situation. When we respond with forethought, we consider what has happened and think through what our response should be. But however, when we have an immediate reaction to something, that reaction is based on the core of who we are within. In a perfect world, our immediate reaction would, would mimic that of our thoughtful one. But that's not always the case. What Joshua was asking of the people was that their response to every situation they faced would be the same, that they would rely on and continue to serve God. As we enter 2021, I want to give you a few choices to consider as your foundation for the new year. Dr. Frankel said that how a prisoner imagined their future impact their longevity. What he was talking about was how a person utilized hope. What were they hoping for that sustained them? Hope, my friends, is not an emotion. Hope is a choice. Either we choose to have it or we choose to give in to what we see and hear. It's all about our choice and that choice is ours. 
And so as we continue in this new year, make the choice to do the following. First, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths, we learn from Proverbs. Before anything else, put your trust in God. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in your bank account. Don't put your trust in your retirement fund. Put your trust in God when you face these 2021 situations that will come, that will come to try to tear you down. Choose to respond from a place of knowing that this God who loves you has you in the palm of his hand and that he will see you through every one of those situations that comes to try to tear you down. And next, firmly, place your trust in God and know that though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. He said, once I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his offspring begging bread, we're told in Psalms. When you put your trust in the Lord and allow him to direct your steps, when you allow him to, to direct your responses, then believe that he has your back. God's got you. If you fall down, things might get tough. Your knees may get straight. You may have a bruise on your elbow, but you will not stay down. You will not be walked away from by God because God has you in his hand. You have to believe it. Quote what David said in verse 25. He says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his offspring begging bread. And then believe. Because we know that in all things, that all things work together for good of them that love God, who are then called according to his purpose from the New Testament Roman scripture. No matter what you face, do you believe that it's all going to work out for your good? Well, the events of 2000 or the events of January 2021 define you or how you respond or will you dedicate yourself to fulfilling God's purpose for your life? Some people temporarily made more money last year due to the stimulus package than they would have made if the pandemic never existed. Why? It was the way it worked out. Good for them. Do you believe that your situation, as bad as it is, is going to work out for your good? I do. I'm optimistic. And then in 2 Corinthians, there's some more words I want you to hear. Remember, Christian, you're not the same as the world. Because those words in 2 Corinthians in the fifth chapter says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. She's a new creature. The old things are passed away. New things have come. Now, all these things are from God who, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us, committed to us, this ministry of reconciliation. Finally, Christian, think, act like Hope like Jesus. The word says, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if you can find any praise, think on these things. We find those words in Philippians. So the question, what will you spend your 2021 thinking about? Will you spend it thinking about all the things that didn't go well for you in 2020? Will you spend it thinking about the trouble on your job? Will you think about it? Will you think about the promotion you didn't receive for all your hard work? Will you spend it thinking about death? Those who have gone on before, will you spend it even fearful for your own life, thinking about your own death? Will you spend it thinking about all of your regrets or will you spend your mental energy thinking about what is true? And the ultimate truth is that God loves you and is sustaining you. So will you spend it thinking about the truth that when you leave this earth, you will be forever in God's presence? 
Will you spend it thinking about things that are honest, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are blessings, things of a good report? These things give us hope while dwelling on the other things wipe out our hope. Will you focus on political matters that have been resolved already? Or will you continue to focus your energy condemning a departed and defeated administration? Or will you work to reconcile back with people who are hurt, people who are divided, people who are desperate for meaning and people who are desperate for love again? We can enter this year with hope, believing that what has been will not continue to be. Or we can enter it with a sense of dread that nothing's gonna change and that this year is gonna be even harder than last year. The choice is ours. How we choose to begin this year mentally will have a great impact on how we go throughout this year. In a recent conversation with my pastor, he reminded me in his new year optimistic methodology. He says that how we begin will often determine how we're gonna end up. And how we begin and how we end relates to our thinking. Only we can change our thinking. Only we can renew our minds and cause us to shift from the negative to the positive for no hope future to one with endless possibilities. And let me remind you of a very important fact. 2020 is gone. 2020 is now our past. We can hold on to it and drag it and all of its reminders into 2021, or we can just wave it goodbye and let it go. It's our choice. It's our choice to continue to make New Elam special to make it a church that is filled with peculiar people following God's lead and, and being disciples who are focused on reconciliation and good works and hope. And only you can make the choice. I've made mine. And I tell you, you've got to make yours. And Joshua made his. And if we choose the right things, we will see God move in our lives in a very powerful, in a very special way this year. And I pray that all of you who want to focus on the positive, I pray you're going to join with me and those who claim the name Christian and that we will make the right choice. And that is the choice that we all have to make. Will we follow the Lord? And so today, the greatest choice that is ever to be made is to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. To make him the Lord of our life to give him control of our lives. And so the invitation as we close this message is, is to those of you who have not made that decision. These are perilous times, but Jesus Christ has promised us a life of hope and faith and eternal joy and fellowship with other believers. Come join with us, give the Lord your life and see your life change for the better. For those of us who have already made the decision to follow Christ, but who are mired in fear and uncertainty and doubt and reminders about all the bad things that have happened. Remember that God is a God of hope. He's the God who holds us in the palm of his hands and he has promised to never let us go. Not just in this life, but for all eternity. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I pray now that you will give consideration to that. Hear the choir as we prepare ourselves for our communion message. God bless you. God bless you all. The choir is gonna sing now.
pray that gratefulness fills your heart as you focus the imagery of the communion elements that are prepared on the table. And I want you to focus, if you will, on the words of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter. It says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles re reclined at the table, and he said unto them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus said he eagerly desired to be in communication, to be in fellowship with his disciples. And so we eagerly now anticipate the fellowship of our being together and being one with Christ. The word just said, he took the bread and broke it and blessed it, and said to the, his disciples, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And then he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The covenant relationship meaning he is ours and we are his. And as we drink this, which represents his blood shed for us at Calvary, we drink in the hope of eternity that resides in his blood and in his body. Let us drink together. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this opportunity to to be together as your people. Bless us, Lord, as we go forth with less anxiety, hope, filling our hearts, making the right choice to follow you, to let your word be the final word in all these matters. And so will you receive the benediction? Until the next time, my friends, May the Lord bless you and, and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may the Lord be gracious unto you. I pray that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and most of all, give you peace and hope. It's in Jesus' name we receive the blessing. We enjoy the fellowship of one another. And together we say, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. Please take the